Thanks, Patrick. Bonjour. I'll uh, make a little bit of small talk while a few people still come in. Uh, thank you so much for getting up at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. I don't know how I did it, so I don't know how so many other people did it. <laughs> uh, I just uh, drank a double cappuccino, so in about 15 minutes, it's going to get crazy up here. <laughs> you, can, you can watch it happen. Um, We're going to be doing a talk today about uh, what hacking was like for me as a punk, despondent youth growing up. Um, originally, uh, the idea was, oh, let's talk about hacking in the 90s, because that's really when we were doing a lot of it. That's when the internet became popular. That's when uh, computers started to be in more and more homes. However, um, I found that my experience with hacking and my start in hacking actually started as I was way younger in the 1980s. So uh, this trip is going to maybe start about the mid-80s, 1983, 1985 or so, and work up from there. Uh, I tried to build a nice flow to it. There, I could not cover all of the bases. There are so many things I could have talked about, uh, but Patrick would only give me an hour. <laughs> so, um, how do you like my translation? Did I do this right? <laughs> it's supposed to be funny, you can laugh. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I will go very quickly for this because I know uh, nobody's that interested. Uh, I am an uh, information security engineer turned penetration tester. Uh, I've worked for very, very large uh, corporations, uh, building very, very cool security stuffs. Uh, and now currently working as, as penetration tester, um, which is okay. I know every InfoSec engineer and everybody, every hacker out there wants to be a pen tester for a living. Uh, it's not as exciting or fun as you think because everybody is vulnerable to the same things. Everyone has the same problem. Uh, it's the same thing all the time. Uh, and mainly because most corporations don't have any business having a penetration test done yet. Uh, they don't even have basic vulnerability management in place. Uh, they don't have patch, cycli patch cycles being done properly. So bringing in a penetration tester when you don't even have your basic setup ready is ridiculous and a big waste of money. Um, nevertheless, I get to rob banks for a living. And I do this all the time. And yes, when you do rob the bank, it's still fun. <laughs> But it can be tedious. Uh, I am, uh, this is my 13th conference I've spoken at this year in my third country. Uh, and it is my final stop on my world tour. <laughs> so thank you, Quebec City. And uh, thank you, Hackfest Canada. Thank you, Patrick, for having me. Uh, thank you for clapping. Uh, let's get right into it. Um, what is hacking? I don't, I don't think that we need to spend a lot of time on this slide. <laughs> um, hacking, as far as I, I like to describe it, is the idea of the discovery, uh, and not only the discovery, but the dissemination of all knowledge. Discovery of knowledge, and then the open sharing of that knowledge with everybody. Um, that's what hacking was back when I started out. Um, it's a long conversation you can have with different people with different views, but that's kind of the definition that applies to how this talk is going to go, so keep that in mind as we go forward. Uh, but I won't get into a big philosophical discussion on why we're all here. Um, so we're going to start off with something that was very near and dear to my heart a very long time ago. Uh, analog cable TV piracy. Uh, did, uh, when did Canada get analog cable? Last year? Was it? <laughs> okay, noted. Uh, was it about with 1980s, 1990s? Probably close to us, right? 1980s? Okay, good. So this will work. I, I gave a similar form of this talk in Iceland, and they had never had analog cable in there. And they were surprisingly knowledgeable about it, which was really interesting. Uh, so I wanted to make sure. Um, uh, by the way, I will be sharing my slide deck up on my GitHub, and I'll put a link up later. Uh, and what's cool about my slide deck is I put a lot of these little like rabbit hole URLs in here that you can go down to spend hours and hours and hours learning about related topics. Uh, and these are the rabbit holes I fell down while researching uh, the topics. And so it's really cool stuff that I just did not have time to talk about or maybe didn't apply. But if you want to grab my slide deck and have some fun and see some weird things. Um, who knows who this guy is on the deck here? 
cool. You give this talk in America, nobody knows, which is ridiculous. <laughs> Somebody say it. Who is that? Max Headroom. Um, that's actually a, uh, a guy who took over a television station when I was maybe six or seven years old, seven, eight. Um, I was watching Doctor Who on uh, our BBC channel, and this came on out of nowhere, middle of the episode. And it was one of the scariest things I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> And it was a guy with a Max Hedrum mask and this swirling background. Uh, and he, you couldn't understand what he was saying. But he was on for a good two or three minutes just saying all kinds of crazy political things. Um, and so that link there at the bottom is uh, information on what that piracy event was and how he did it and the fact that they never caught him. And it's really cool. Um, so let's talk a bit about analog cable. Um, because it was analog, it meant that there was no real two-way communication because there was only one line. It just everyone who had a, a wire, a copper wire, a coaxial copper wire running to their house got the same signal, the same electrical signal from the TV company. Uh, and that meant that nobody's boxes were phoning home. You didn't have an IP address on your television or, or your TV equipment like you do now. Uh, everyone just got the same thing, uh, and because of that, anyone who was attempting to do something malicious, attempting to steal a signal, do something like that, uh, it wasn't really easy for the cable companies to be able to catch them. Um, the best you, they could tell is that there was a significant drop in the signal power in an area because somebody had spliced into the line, uh, and beyond that, they had to send someone out and literally just test every split in the line and figure out where it went, and that was tedious, and you had to pay a lot of people, and so generally they didn't do that for the home users. Uh, it wasn't a huge concern. Um, so what that meant was if you wanted cable in your house, you literally just went out to the, to the pole, to the telephone pole, where all the cable lines were strung, and you just tapped into what was up there. Um, and because the, the way that they sent you things that were like uh, pay-per-view uh, or premium channels uh, and all of that that were only for specific users was because it was still analog all that got sent to every house uh, and um, a lot of people think that that was scrambled who remembers the scrambled uh, TV images that looked like this <laughs> who <laughs> we're not gonna say why we remember these scrambled TV images <laughs> we're just going to say that we've made, we were scrolling and happened to see uh, an excellent documentary <laughs> on uh, animal behaviors. So um, <laughs> I did. I put the NSFW tag, so don't watch this at work. <laughs> um, and so, uh, how do you think that 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 scrambling was done? Do you think that that was done at the station, and then they only uh, descrambled it for certain users that had paid for that? That's not possible. Why? Because they can't target you. Because it was, there was no two-way communication. There was no addressing system. Well, there was an addressing system. And it was basically the serial number on your cable box that the line plugged into. Uh, but there was still no two-way communication. So the way the signal worked is everything was clear on its way to your house. And your cable box in your house is what did the scrambling. So your own equipment was taking in plain text and then obfuscating, which is great. <laughs> um, and and uh, because of that, uh, it was really easy to descramble these channels. It was really easy to build what we call black boxes uh, that descrambled, but in reality, they weren't descrambling at all. All they were doing was uh, intercepting the electrical signal on the line that your box interpreted as, hey, make sure you're scrambling this channel, and it just dissipated it to heat. Remember, it was all analog. So it took this pulse of electricity, converted it to heat, your cable box never got it. So all your cable box is doing is just taking in everything and throwing it right onto your screen. Um, and that was great for a very long time. You, you could get your hands on a black box easy. You could build your own black box very easily if you wanted. Um, they were easy, they were about $100 uh, which is a little much at the time, but when you consider how much any premium channel cost, uh, it quickly paid for itself. Um, and uh, the cable companies 
wanted to crack down on who was making these black boxes. Just like drug dealers, like catching the guy on the street selling it, not a huge deal. What you want to do is you want to catch the guy who's giving him the stuff. You want to catch the, the bigger problem, the guy who's making thousands of these black boxes and selling them to people on what was essentially Craigslist back then. Uh, and so a really cool story I'll share about that is uh, there was a Mike Tyson fight. Who remembers Mike Tyson? Everybody knows Mike Tyson. He's probably the most famous boxer of all time, arguably, uh, or maybe the craziest. It's Mike Tyson. So uh, Mike Tyson in the U.S. was huge, huge, and that was the pay-per-view event. There was two that everyone got. It was Mike Tyson, and it was WWF wrestling. It was WrestleMania. Uh, and so when Mike Tyson had a fight, you knew somebody who had the Tyson fight on pay-per-view, and it was incredibly expensive. Um, so chances are you actually just knew somebody who was stealing pay-per-view and had the Tyson fight. And so they wanted to crack down on these people. But how do you crack down on these people when you can't target them, when you can't identify them, their system doesn't talk back, they don't have an IP address, and you can't scramble at your end and uh, de-scramble on the other. Um, they found a way to target these people by... Uh, I'll, here, I'll just tell you a story. Um, so if you are stealing pay-per-view, that means that 24 hours a day, your pay-per-view channel is descrambled, right? No matter what's on, you just turn on that channel. There it is, because you never got the scramble signal. There wasn't always something on pay-per-view. There was blank areas, because there wasn't always a Mike Tyson or fight, fight or whatever. Uh, and so this particular night, they had a Mike Tyson fight that was, say, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., and then 8 p.m. to 8.30 was nothing, just blank. There'd be, you get a black screen or color bars. And then 8.30 to 10 was something else. So who is watching, who can see that blank segment between 8 and 8.30? The, the pirates, the people stealing pay-per-view. Because the way the signal works with the pay-per-view is 6 to 8, you get the descramble signal or stop scrambling signal. <laughs> 8 o'clock, you get the start scrambling. 8.30, you'll, if you paid for it, you would get the stop scrambling again. So 8 to 8.30, the only people who can see this are uh, people watching pay-per-view, stealing pay-per-view. So what do you think they did? Sent them an angry message on the screen, like, hey, you should stop. Uh, <laughs> no. They tried to sell them something. They said, hey... Thanks for buying that Mike Tyson fight on pay-per-view. We would like to send you a free Mike Tyson hat. And in the 80s, everybody wanted hats. <laughs> I don't know, big trucker hats. But you get a free Mike Tyson hat. All you have to do is call in and give us your address, and we'll send you a Mike Tyson hat. And he's going to autograph it. <laughs> Who doesn't want to autograph Mike Tyson hat? Just call us, give us your address. Done. No shipping and handling. No payment. Um, and it worked really well. <laughs> and so I asked, I asked my friend who was working at the cable company at the time, and I asked him recently, not when I was seven years old, <laughs> I asked them, so what did you do? You send the FBI to all these people's houses? And he goes, no. The guy who owned the station, the first thing he said is, no, you don't, you don't sue your own customers. Because most of those people were still at least paying for basic cable and just descrambling the premium stuff. Because, no, you don't, don't sue your customers. What they wanted to do was find, the, find out where they got these black boxes from. And so when you'd call this number in and give them your address, um, an FBI agent would call you back later and say, hey, we have all this information. We know that you're stealing cable. We want to know where'd you get the box. And 80% of people would give up their source. And it worked really well for cracking down heavily on the black boxes. And they did this tactic all the time. And all you had to do was just ask people who were stealing your stuff to call and give you their address. <laughs> um, so say you wanted to do this yourself. Say, like, hey, I don't want to pay the cable guy 100 bucks to go patch me in up there, because that's what you used to do. You just, if you saw him installing cable at someone's house, he'd just walk over with $100 and go, hey, but, but that house too. And he'd go, all right, I'm already up there. Because there was no way to track him. Uh, and they would give you the cable box because they would take huge armloads of them from the warehouse because their inventory wasn't tracked. Uh, and every now and then, uh, the cable companies would ask for an inventory from all their distributors, and they would say, here's all the serial numbers we have, 
in the warehouses, here's the ones we've sold, here's what we can't account for. And then the cable companies would send uh, a, de -scram or a start scrambling on, on all channels signal to any of the missing serial numbers. And then any valid customers that called and complained, they just ship them a new box. But that was the only way you could do it. Like you couldn't target individual boxes. You had to put send this huge signal down containing like all of these serial numbers. Uh, DirecTV, Dish Network, all of those still use a similar system because the uplink is so slow. They still send down the ID number of your specific card and tell it what it can and can't descramble uh, and all of that. So still in use today. Uh, but if you wanted to do this yourself, you had to figure out how. And you're not just going to go up on the pole and just start connecting wires together and see what happens. Uh, and so the way I learned about it, and a lot of people at the time learned about it, was text files. Who knows what text files are? Who's seen this word text files, like one word? Um, cool. This is a good audience for this, then. Um, text files were what they sound like. They were text files. They were uh, ASCII files that were around, I can't say the internet, because the internet wasn't around yet. They were on servers that you could dial into and find in special places, and they contained information about performing legally questionable acts, <laughs> morally obscure, <laughs> Uh, but because things like JPEGs even were so comparably huge at the time versus you're dialing in with a 9600 baud modem that's 9.6 kilobits a second. Um, do you know what it took to download a picture? Do you, there, five minutes? Yeah, can you imagine X hamster? <laughs> of course not, none of us can. Um, uh, again, don't Google that at work either. Uh, <laughs> can imagine it. <laughs> so um, what we had was like these these images here. This was actually the picture of the top of the cable boxes they were starting to drop in people's backyards in the newer subdivisions in the suburbs where they weren't running telephone pole lines anymore. And so you would get a picture like this, like if you open up the lid, you will see four terminals here. And like, this is your thing you had to go by. And uh, a lot of people killed the cable signal to their subdivision. <laughs> there was a lot of problem. <laughs> Some people I knew very personally. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. It was whoever made this text file. So where did you find these text files specifically? Um, they were on what was called BBS or billboard servers. Who remembers billboard servers? BBSs. Yes, that always gets a good response. BBS servers were kind of one of the starts of what we n call the internet today. Uh, they weren't part of the internet from the ground up. They were something that was out there that kind of influenced how the internet still works now. Uh, and they were servers that somebody ran out of their house usually. Uh, and it was a, usually also a guy's computer that he used. Uh, and it was, uh, a, uh, it was a phone line that he also used. Uh, and so they had these text files on them that had pretty much everything you can imagine, like I said, that's nefarious, including uh, a lot of vulnerabilities uh, uh, browser vulnerabilities, software vulnerabilities, things like that. We were already getting into software exploits here. Uh, we were already getting into how to attack other people's computers when we didn't even have an internet up yet. Like e nearly every computer out there was direct dial. You, you picked up the phone and you literally called somebody's computer. Um, specific uh, item of note was, is the wardial.exe. That was like, there was two default things you put on your BBS server when you stood it up. One was the Anarchist Cookbook. Who knows the Anarchist Cookbook? Yeah, it's, it's the most hands I've gotten yet. <laughs> one was the Anarchist Cookbook, uh, and one was wardial.exe. Uh, and uh, I think we'll talk about that one in a bit. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, later. So uh, um, BBS servers... Like I said, we're in someone's home using someone's phone line. And if you wanted to call one, first you had to find the phone number for it. And so there was these big lists that were distributed that had all these BBS phone numbers. And you would find these lists on other BBS servers. And so you would kind of hop around like that. And uh, usually you got your start because somebody had a printout of some BBS phone numbers. Uh, and that was hard to find too because 
we didn't have printers in our houses. So like you had to know somebody who either worked in a computer store or in an office that had the money to get one of these fancy new like printer things that were coming out. And they could print uh, a dot matrix listing of BBS phone numbers for you. Uh, and then you could get in and you could download more. And you had to save these phone numbers somewhere. And we didn't have hard drive space. So we would save everything we had on floppy disks, and everyone had this box of 100 floppy disks that you have to flip through to find. And you never marked them right, because you were always using like every last kilobyte of space on them. So you'd start off like super organized, like, I'm going to mark this one images, and then this one is BBS phone numbers. And then by the end, you have 100 floppy disks of who knows. <laughs> so you're like, oh, I got 8K left on that one, though, so I'll put it here. And I'll move it later when I buy more floppies. And then you would never remember to, and then your shit's just a mess. Um, and so you're calling phone numbers. And th at, at this point in time, most people didn't have multiple phone lines in their house because it was really expensive. You pretty much had to own a business and run it out of your home if you could get a second phone line. Uh, so you would set your modem, you'd set your computer to call up this other computer, and it would ring, and it would ring. And then some guy would answer. And he's, Hello? And you'd have to pick up your phone and go, um, uh, I'm calling for the BBS. <laughs> and you go, okay, uh, call back in five minutes. And he'd hang up. And then what he'd have to, he'd go boot up the computer. He'd move the phone lines around just for you. Just for you. And he'd plug all the stuff in. And then you'd call back in five minutes. And it would ring twice. And then you'd get that horrible modem sound that I think we all know. Uh, and then you would get a little text-based menu, and it was all, there was no images. It was all text-based and command line, which was really cool. Um, ASCII, this is where ASCII art really got its start, was BBSs and the fact that images were so huge. Um, and so that was weird, because you would be calling people you didn't know, saying, can I, uh, I'm tr can I get into your computer? I go, yeah, and then boot it up. And <laughs> it's kind of weird now. <laughs> Some stranger, that's literally what it was. Uh, and like some of the documents in those in those BBSs was for how to hack BBSs. <laughs> it's like <laughs> you have some BBS hacking files in your BBS. I'd like to access. Is that okay? Thanks. Or sometimes like, especially if you're real young, like, like me, like if some guy answered, you just you hung up. You're like, nope, disconnect. No, nope, I don't want to talk to people. Um, so. Um, let's talk about war dialing now. We mentioned this uh, this war dial.exe file. Uh, that was on all the BBSs. Uh, who knows where the, the phrase, first who knows what war dialing is? War dialing is the idea of just going through a huge list of phone numbers and seeing which one has a computer on the other end, similar to what we call war driving now with Wi-Fi, if anyone does that anymore even, uh, and war anything else that involves moving around or going down a list. Um, why war dialing? Where did the war and war dialing come from? from war games. Who's seen war games? Everybody here. Yeah. So uh, somebody made, and, that, and what was the kid doing at the beginning of war games? It's exactly what he was doing. He was calling phone numbers, trying to find a computer on the other end. And somebody wrote an executable, called it war dial because of war games. And this became incredibly popular. Um, started the word war dialing, which we still use in some context today, and it did, in fact, come from uh, war games. Um, and so the way that worked is you would just give it a huge list of phone numbers, uh, and it would just go down the list. It would ring twice and hang up, because uh, if, uh, if nobody picked up by the second ring, that means there's not a computer on the other end, because computers always picked up by the second ring. And so it would just go down and mark which ones had a carrier signal on the other end, and then you would have to go back later manually and dial into each of those and see uh, exactly what it was. Um, what's really cool about dialing direct into a server. Anybody? You're dialing direct into a server. You're bypassing any perimeter security that that company may have had whatsoever because it's literally a phone line from in the alley out back all the way into that box. Uh, and so that, that was really, really fun uh, because most people weren't even thinking security. This was all set up for redundancy uh, and, and ease of quick access. Security was, was not even an afterthought. It was no thought. There was no thought on security. Um, cool uh, thing I mentioned here uh, was a bunch of guys from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the 414s, who just war dialed their way into tons of companies and wreaked a lot of havoc. havoc. 
um, simply by using default credentials on everything they found and getting into a lot of stuff because we left default credentials on things that we connected to the public te telephone system. That's how much we weren't thinking about security. Uh, and these kids got on the news. The head of the 414s was on the cover of Newsweek for being like a substantial individual and he was this 14-year-old and all he did was just dial phone numbers and go, admin, password. No, okay, next one, admin, pastor. And he got on Newsweek for that. <laughs> it was that substantial of a thing. Um, so let's, let's, let's talk about, about things like that. Um, right early 90s, 93, 94, the internet really started taking off. Uh, started exploding, especially in the US. There's a big push to get it in schools and libraries right off the bat. Um, AOL, CompuServe, Prodigy, a lot of those got very popular in the US. And we all at least had a friend whose parents had enough money to get a computer for the house and possibly uh, an ISP account like that. Uh, it was not cheap at all. Uh, the computer was usually a shared computer for the family. No one had personal computers. Uh, it, was a, it was usually in the, the family room, a, a shared living space in the house. And so whatever you were doing on that computer, pretty much everyone could see what you were up to. Um, so we spent a lot of time on the computers uh, after midnight when the <laughs> people weren't wandering around the house so much. Um, some fun facts about the internet in the 90s. Everything in every company had a public IP. I mean, every server in your company has a public IP, has an IP I can at least ping from my house. How awesome is that? <laughs> there was, like, lands were not really built out. Network infrastructure wasn't really a thing. Network hardware wasn't huge. Uh, it was very expensive. Um, not everyone had it, especially um, if you were a smaller business trying to just make it as in some sort of internet-based entity. Um, what's that? Oh, there was no NAT. Absolutely no NAT whatsoever. Uh, and because there was no NAT and because there is usually no LAN uh, or no LAN to speak of or of note or of um, importance, um, how were you transferring information between all of these systems in your company. You were usually just FTPing, uh, using those public IPs back and forth over the internet. And while SSH, TLS, SSL over Telnet did eventually come around, um, as with all brand new technologies, especially brand new back-end technologies like that, they weren't immediately adopted. Um, they took up a lot of resources, the, uh, system resources, um, you know, encrypting traffic live. Sorry. Hey, Patrick, John McAfee's calling you. He's got it. Okay. Yeah, he's up here Skyping on John McAfee while I'm trying to get ready for my talk. I'm like, <laughs> hey, John. Um, <laughs> so uh, it was really hard to implement those technologies because you couldn't just stick them on anything and they were unstable and it was kind of rough. So the vast majority of the time, you're looking at plain text traffic, FTP, and you're transferring important things, usually. So it's somewhat important, and we'll talk about that later. Um, so what does all of that mean? Uh, that means that this was my Friday nights. Uh, I mean, someone I know was doing this on Friday nights. <laughs> um, nearly everything out there was running Unix. Um, There's a lot of IBM, a lot of Solaris, uh, because uh, we're talking before IIS was out. Uh, we're talking before Windows Server was out. Um, NT6 started to really come into prevalence. That's really when Microsoft Server stuff took off because LANs were getting popular. But look... Microsoft didn't really have a foothold in here yet. It was pretty much Unix all day. Linux was certainly not a, a, a big thing uh, at the start of this. It was just a, a gleam in Linus's eye. Um, and so it was 
find an IP, <coughs> pardon me, uh, find a server, find their FTP connection, which was always on port what? Every time. Yeah, they would, and this is before port scanners, so like if they weren't on port 21, you had a little bit of difficulty, but generally just everything's default. Um, and, and then uh, you would crash the FTP service. And crashing services was really easy back then. Buffer overflows was like, you could do that to anything. It was like a guarantee. And you could do them really easy. You could, you could throw a buffer overflow like, by just giving it a, a thousand character password and the whole service would just crash. And so, um, and, and so, of course, because everyone does everything by default and for convenience and quickness, what user did they have FTP running as? on their Unix systems. Root. And so what happens when you crash a service <laughs> using a buffer overflow? It drops you to the prompt. What prompt do you get when you crash a service that's running as root? You get the root prompt. I'm 14, doing this in my friend's basement, getting root on all these companies' boxes. Uh, and it was, like I said, just simple buffer overflows. Uh, and then what you do is you would fire up TCP dump and just listen to all of that plain text traffic all day. Just everything plain text. Nothing was encrypted. Um, the upside being that most companies weren't doing anything massively substantial with these internet-based servers. It was still kind of a thing companies were playing with, getting on the cutting edge of. Um, they weren't transferring their financial data through them usually um, or even storing them on there. A lot of this stuff was still done locally, um, but that quickly changed. And as the years went on, we'd find more and more interesting things. Um, TCP dump didn't have like ASCII output at the time. Like you couldn't just grep for credentials. You had to take you know what it was capturing, all the hex it was grabbing. And, uh, and look for specific credential strings of hex and then convert those, um, which was fun at the time. Not fun now. Uh, but then eventually somebody had a separate program where you could, you could pipe your TCP dump into that and it would convert it to ASCII and then you could grep out of that. Uh, and that was fun stuff. Um, passwords, like I said, often default or often very easy. We're talking four to six character passwords. We're talking things you can guess. Usually it was the name of the company uh, or it was the name of a product that they sold. Uh, we spent a lot of time just guessing passwords that way too. Um, so like I said, everything's got a public IP. That means you essentially have no DMZ. Um, firewalls uh, initially didn't even exist. Um, as, the, as people who I knew uh, became more prevalent. Um, things like security technologies and blinky boxes started to crop up. Um, firewalls were one of the big things that said, hey, well, at least we can say you can't just come in on every single port and just connect to port 22 on the server, even though it's just supposed to be a web server. Uh, you know, I'm explaining how firewalls work. Like, you need that. Um, and people would buy these things. Companies with a ton of money would buy these big, expensive firewalls that at relative to what firewalls do today, did practically nothing and slowed your traffic down. But there was some kind of security measure. And people didn't know how to configure them. Um, people didn't have a knowledge of, of TCP IP like they do today. Like You didn't have network engineers. You had an IT guy. And while I'm sure all of us in this room wear multiple hats at all of our companies, um, a lot of these companies had one IT guy. And then you give them this brand new firewall technology that's got like an instruction manual that literally was, it was this thick, spiral bound, and you just got to just take this thing home and read it and then program a firewall that has an interface that no one's ever seen before. Um, one of the most common things that I found was um, mirroring the, the, the connection ports where you would set up a rule that says like, okay, uh, so I say I want people to be, coming, be able to come in on 21 to hit the FTP server. Um, I'm going to program them in here saying uh, if the source port is port 21, let them in. And what's wrong with that? 
it won't work unless what? And then if you set your source port to 21, what do you have access to on the other side? Literally everything. Because your only rule says, if your source port's 21, let them hit that, that box. Or they weren't going that far. They weren't specifying IPs. They were saying, if the source port's 21, let them in. And then that wouldn't work. They go, oh, it's, it's uh, or they would, they would see that you were, they were able to get some more stuff than they were supposed to if they were doing valid testing. And then what they would do is they would just put in a second rule that said, oh, if the destination port's 21, let them in. But they would never get rid of that first rule. Uh, and then a lot of times what we'd find is a bunch of rules of somebody clearly trying to figure out how to do something, and then just an any, any rule at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> just so we'd like find firewalls after we were in and then be like what happened here <laughs> how much did they pay for this thing that they've they've put a bypass rule on and they think it's working um ids has started to come out um and again <laughs> just garbage they would look for like very simple things like now port scanners had become prevalent. So your, sig you, your IDS had like two signatures and one was like, uh, see if anybody is pinging uh, consecutive ports in a row. And if they are, that's a hacker. How do you bypass that? Yeah, you just randomize your ports. And that's, now I've bypassed your $10,000 IDS. It was like that. It was that easy. And, and they'd say, oh, here's how you can write your own signatures. But you didn't have security engineers. You didn't even have network engineers. But you had an IT guy who was supposed to write signatures for this brand new thing that nobody understands uh, without Google. I can't do my job without Google. And I rob banks. <laughs> and then... And then Microsoft released IIS. And that was, that was like our 9-11. That, <laughs> that was our target breach. That was, oh man, that was, those were the golden days. Um, at that point, everyone was setting up websites. Every, every guy who ran a computer store wanted to stand up a website because we were geeks and we, and we thought the internet was incredible and it was and it is and we wanted to be on it. We wanted to be part of the cutting edge technology. We wanted to do everything that was new and cool and at that time, man, having a website, you were the coolest kid on earth. I had one of the first websites on the internet and it was just like one of those free like make your own website things but I had it in like the end of 1992 when I could go to like at school in the computer lab, because I was lucky enough to have a school with a computer lab, which we had like six computers, um, <laughs> we, I could show a girl my website on the internet. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, I got a website. See, that's me in that picture. <laughs> it's got two pictures. <laughs> the second one's my cat. So I also get to claim that I had one of the first cat pictures on the internet. So you're welcome, everybody. It was me. I'm there. Thanks for the applause. That's the correct response to that. I'll do this. Were you guys at Hackfest Canada when Johnny Christmas claimed to invent cat pictures on the internet? That guy's amazing. <laughs> so, um, once again, now you've got people who don't really understand new technology. New technology on its own being incredibly insecure just by nature of what it is, um, the internet was being wrecked. Um, it, was, it was the wildest of the Wild West. Anybody with a big enough gun could own the internet. Uh, and it wasn't a huge deal because, once again, people weren't putting tons of stuff on the internet. Uh, they weren't hosting anything vastly important. The, the majority of these sites were literally like, come to Joe's computer shack where we'll upgrade your RAM for $9.95. Here's a picture of RAM. <laughs> and so, yeah, I could get into that guy's site and deface it and go, your RAM is $99.95. Uh, and it's great. So what? When you're 15, 16, and you're wrecking the internet like that, it's the greatest feeling on earth. Uh, and so it, defacing was a huge problem, but only relative to what the problems out there were. Um, one of the cool things you could do, 
and this eventually started to get some bad legal precedents, was intercept sensitive information. If you got your hands on it, and this is financial information, emails, things like that, because once again, not a lot of encryption going on. Uh, and you would print this out somewhere, usually at the library or at school, and you would walk into the front door of the corporation with, these, with this paperwork and go, hey, so you've got all this stuff out there on the internet. Uh, I'd like to fix that for you for $10,000. And yeah, we laugh now. Back then, the companies would go, oh, okay, come here. That's where the computers are. If, do you want to just, here, go. And uh, eventually what happened was cor corporations started suing. Uh, they were calling it uh, blackmail. Um, even if you didn't threaten to show the world all this horrible information you found about them, they were calling it blackmail, and they were winning because they had more money than we did to pay better lawyers. Um, so what does that sound like? That sounds like dumpster diving uh, on the internet, the internet, though. And who remembers dumpster diving? A very slim amount of people. So dumpster diving is what it sounds like. Um, anybody who comes to me later and tell me what movie that scene is from, I will get a beer. <laughs> That's a horrible, horrible movie, and it's fantastic. Um, so dumpster diving was literally jumping into a dumpster and seeing what you could find. Now, you wouldn't do it outside of like restaurants where there's horrible things. Uh, you would do it outside of companies that regularly threw out paper. Um, uh, my favorites, other, uh, other people's favorites, were <laughs> uh, big box stores, anyone that did tons and tons of credit card transactions, Turkey City, Best Buy, et cetera, um, because back then, Receipts had plain text credit card numbers on them. And at the end of the day, when you'd close out your credit card machine, it would print every credit card number that you took in that day. And then your cash register guy would write down the total from that onto his log sheet for his register, and then he would take this big pile of credit card numbers, and he would go thunk, right in the garbage. And then that garbage gets emptied into the dumpster times 8, 10, 12 cashiers a day. Every day in the dumpster, thousands of credit card numbers. And you go, so, so you get your credit card number. What are you going to do with that? Well, uh, what you're going to do uh, is because, A, there was no CVV at the time. All you needed was a credit card number. Uh, what they were doing to protect against fraud, uh, and this was fraud back when you couldn't order things online, you had to call places. And remember, as seen on TV, and like, oh, Four easy payments in 1995, plus shipping and handling. You'd, you'd call those places, and you would give them the address uh, of whatever house was being built on your block or was for sale, um, because they weren't doing address verification. If you had a credit card number, you were in. The, the world was your oyster. And so you just ship the box down the street. The UPS guy would go, oh, no one's home. I'm leaving on the porch. And then you just keep looking until you see a box turn up. They'd never catch you. So I had a lot of dumb toys in the 90s. Uh, and so once the internet started getting more prevalent, um, this, the rise of the hackers and the crackers came to be with online forums and chat rooms and things like that, enabling people to constantly talk to each other. This diversion happened. Uh, and in 1993, the hackers were the white hats. The hackers were the, uh, the purists, the ones I was talking about who were like, we find out how everything works. We discover all knowledge, and we share that freely with all people. We're the, the saviors of humankind. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the crackers were the black cats. The crackers are the people who focused on circumventing security, uh, breaking into systems, usually defacing websites, stealing information, doing malicious things. Um, and they... And, and the hackers hated them. And that's why they were given their own name, crackers. Like, There's, those aren't hackers. They're doing bad things. Don't associate them with us. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, once the internet started getting really big, um, it, the white hats disappeared. Um, every white hat was also a black hat. And it was just black hats deciding what information they found that they were going to share. Uh, and... The crackers were the skiddies, the low-level guys who were stealing uh, stuff from the, from the hackers and just writing key gens and things like that. Uh, still, they hated each other. Uh, and there was a big thing where, like, you, wouldn't call, you never called yourself a hacker. Uh, calling yourself a hacker online is like calling yourself undoxable. Like, you, you were destroyed. So no, you got called a hacker, 
No, you did not call yourself a hacker because the hackers would come after you to prove that you were lying. Uh, and now it's kind of all the same. Um, uh, running low on time, I'll skip ahead here. Uh, so um, a lot of the web exploits that we were using back then are what we're still using now and freaking out about now. SQLI, I was using in 1995, 96, 97. We just called it SQL. It was just try SQL. And it works. And ha ha, it works. Um, it, hacking JavaScript. JavaScript uh, was, was super easy. Um, we would send pop-ups to our friends all the time as a gag. Like you just send an IM with a link and everybody would click on stuff. Uh, it, everybody clicked everything because it was like, oh, the internet, more internet, cool. Hey, look at this internet I found. Um, phishing, I used to send, send friends <laughs> just an HTML attachment that was just where I'd saved the login page from the email that they were using and then they would just send the credentials and so they would just open this and go, oh, it wants me to log in again. Oh, computers. Oh, every time, 100% success rate. Like, I've been doing phishing since 1994. Uh, so, like, why is this only a big deal now? Uh, why were we screaming about this 15 years ago? Um, it, it's because, like I said, there wasn't a lot going on in the internet. There wasn't a lot of huge e-commerce going on. Massive corporations weren't getting owned at the time because they didn't have a lot of exposure. Um, the countries where a lot of malicious stuff's coming from now had no internet whatsoever. Uh, and... Uh, so it was mostly you'd get hit by like one-off guys, and it was a lot of pranksters. It was a lot of people running DDS atta uh, DDoS attacks, um, and nobody had invented marketing terms for all these things, um, and which we all scoff at, like uh, marketing terms. But like, look how huge XSS is now. That's like a basic thing everyone tries to protect against. It's been around for 15 years. Nobody give a gave a crap about it before we called it XSS. I just called it reading other people's live journals. <laughs> we have names for it. Um, and so, like, why, why is this still a problem now that we, like, have this fear of it and we have these marketing terms and these buzzwords that we can give to our CIO and go, hey, man, XSS, we got to stop this XSS, SQLI. Why is this still going on every day, all day, in brand new things that we're putting out? Why are there botnets full of refrigerators on the internet? It's true, look it up. Um, <laughs> start one. Uh, and it, it's, it's because we're still using security as an afterthought in our companies. Um, our companies are creating a product without having security involved in the creation of that product. The product either being software or literally being a refrigerator. And they're asking security to look at the product after the fact. They're going to go, cool, product A is done. Hey, security, can you do a quick review of this and make sure it's cool? And yeah, you can. And you could, you could put all your effort into reviewing that thing and said, yeah, this looks good. But you're just one guy. And you weren't involved in it from the get-go. You don't know every last aspect of what went on in the development of whatever that product is. Um, our companies have such a huge push, especially technology companies, to just get the newest, most brand new thing out there as fast as possible. And whatever, we'll patch it in post. Who plays video games? Who buys a brand new video game on launch day and has to download a two gig patch for it? Who bought Halo 5 and is still angry? Because we've got this all, we'll fix it, we'll just fix it later uh, mentality. And now we've got botnets full of refrigerators buying bitcoins. <laughs> and, it's, and it's because we're not getting involved in our companies from the get-go. We're not being more forceful with security. We're not playing our role as security engineers at our companies. We're not taking that step forward. We're not putting our foot down. We're just sitting in the background. We're waiting for people to come to us. And when we come to them and they push back, we go, all right, well, I tried. You need to start changing the security culture of your company. 
the culture. You need to turn it around. You need to make it so every new project that starts has a security uh, engineer or some member of security, an architect, what have you, on that project from day one at every meeting or every other meeting or having regular reviews in your SDLC to make sure that security is being implemented as a natural part of how it works. Because I've been doing the same exact crap for 15 years and owning all of you. If you haven't figured it out in 15 years, you need to start changing what's going on at the very core level in your companies. Uh, and so that's, that's the message I'm trying to get out to you guys. I really, really hope you take some of this at heart. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, HackFest Canada. It's been a blast.